There's something odd going on in Europe for the 2023-24 season as leagues around Europe have thrown up a few little surprises for us. The last trophy that Brest won was League 2 in 1981 before I was even a twinkle in my dad's eye yet somehow managed to finish third in League 1 in the Champions League place. And then there's Bologna who haven't played in the top European competition since back in 1964 yet as I type with the game to go have qualified for the Champions League for the first time since. There's Girona who I recently did a video on and Stuttgart who haven't finished this high in a long time. So, why? What's happening around Europe? Why are these teams ripping up the history book and finding themselves loitering near the top of their leagues? Are they really better, or have the other teams around them just been more crap? Stick around to find out. Firstly, a trip to Germany. Stuttgart are a long way away from their glory years of winning the Bundesliga 2007 with players such as Sami Khedira, Mario Gomez and Thomas Hitzelsberger, and in the 2022-23 season even finishing the bottom three only avoiding relegation through the playoffs beat in Hamburg, so to see them finish second is quite the turnaround. Manager Sebastian Hernes used to coach the Bayern young ones and joined Stuttgart when they were rock bottom of the league in April 23. His uncle is German legend Uli Hoeneß, who won the World Cup and the Euros. His dad Dieter was also a player, not quite on the same level as uncle, he's only won six caps and he's now his agent. Well even so, winning is in their family DNA. Even so, a second place finish was about as likely as VAR getting a decision right, so how did they do it? Number one on the list was turning Sehuji Rassi's loan permanent, which they did before the season. In return, he scored 15 goals in his first nine matches, which beat Lewandowski's record of most goals in the first seven matches of a season, which is a bit of a weird record. He finished the season as top scorer in the league, that is if we take Kane's mad season out of the equation, with a ridiculous 28 goals in 28 games, although he only got two assists, the greedy bugger. But simply he's had the season of his life, scoring twice as many as his previous best scoring season, not including the Afghan where he didn't score at all, although his goals did dry up a little as he knackered his hamstring in October. Stuttgart's style of play brings out all his best attributes, so it's probably a little worrying to the club that his release clause is so low. 17.5 million euros which rises to 20 million in the summer. And Stuttgart have tried and failed to renegotiate, so who knows where we'll see him next season. And talking of loans, goalkeeper Alexander Nerbel's on loan from Bayern and has had a pretty solid season with 10 clean sheets and brings a load of experience to the table having won the Champions League, Bundesliga and Cup. Although played four games for Bayern in four years so I'm not really sure they all count to be honest but he's been pretty good so it's a shame he returns to Bayern's bench in July 2024. In front of Nerbel, or should I say in front and to the left a bit as he plays on the left flank, is Max Mittelstadt. He was surely in a good position to be Germany's new left back at the Euros. His good season has been rewarded with recent call-ups against France and the Netherlands who he scored against and is a good solution for what has historically been a problem spot for Germany. Julian Nagelsmann claimed he's statistically the best Bundesliga left back by some margin right now and one of the best four left backs in the world. So Stuttgart did a decent bit of business when they paid his release clause to get him from Hertha Berlin, half a million euros. He's aggressive in attack and defence, good on the ball, and crosses more than anyone else on the team. Bit of a change from the 2018-19 season when he deactivated his social media accounts after many Hertha fans were being a bit mean to him as they were unhappy with him not leaving up to a potential. But it's no good having good players if the system ain't right and this is where Stuttgart have got it spot on. The team plays exciting football, probably the most exciting in the league behind only Leverkusen, keeping high possession and dominating him with the ball but also able to play on the counter and they had to cope with the loss of big players before the season such as Mavropanos to West Ham, Sosa to Ajax which cost director Sven Mislit at his job and Endo to Liverpool meaning they sold Hendo just to buy Endo if you catch my drift. The targeted pros with Bundesliga experience and a few German speakers which helps you know in Germany and Hernes himself has improved after being sacked from Hoffenheim recognising he should have pushed for more change earlier. The experience helped him better understand what kind of players he needed and what the squad was supposed to look like. He once travelled to Brighton to study De Zerbe's tactics, and while there a conversation with Pascal Gross led to him signing Undav on loan who has had a cracking season. His tactics are also influenced by Pep, and when Hernes was doing his pro licence he did an internship at Bayern while Pep was there and they spent a bit of time together talking about Pep's ideas. Ernest didn't have the checkbook to implement all the ideas, but was a vital part of his development. Now, this is a talented side mostly put together by former sporting director Sven Mislintat, who said Alfie Saints to get to Ajax in April 2023, but it also helps that expectations were low. After narrowly avoiding the drop last year, they've only finished in the top 10 in the league twice in the last 11 years. 
It's probably helped the new players to express themselves better in their weighted expectations, leading to almost immediate successes from players like Stiller and Undav, as well as Nurbel and Mittelstadt. Silas on the right has played some of the best stuff of his career, and French midfielder Enzo Milo has channeled his inner Zidane to become one of the best number 10s in the league. Up front, Chris Führig is a late bloomer and got himself into the preliminary Germany squad for the Euros, and so has Captain Voldemar Anton, who was born in a little town called Uzbekistan and recently made his debut for Deutschland, and they take their place on the list alongside Nurbel, Michestat and Undav. So it could be said that Ernest had done a pretty decent job at um, Verein für Be 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 uh, Stuttgart. Simply put, Hernes overperforms with teams. He won the Drei Liga with the Bayern under 23s when they weren't expected to finish top half, so no surprise they got relegated the season after he left, and he worked minor miracles at Hoffenheim, something they only really appreciated after he'd gone. The elephant in the room, of course, is that some of the other teams haven't been quite as good as they usually would be, which has enabled Stuttgart to move up the table. But it's no wonder that Hernes has been rumoured to be a candidate to replace Tuchel at Bayern. And who knows, as Uncle Uli is Bayern's honorary president and still pulls the strings behind the scenes, so we'll have to wait and see. Over to the land of pasta, pizza and, oh, I don't know, Super Mario. Bologna sprung a huge surprise and have qualified for the Champions League for the first time in 60 years. A year on from finishing the lowly ninth, just like another famous Italian son, Rocky Balboa, they came out fighting this season. Joshua Zerks, he had a great season with 15 goal contributions. Young defender Riccardo Calafiori had a top season as a big factor in such a tight defence, with no team other than the Champions Inter conceding less goals. Riccardo Orsellini hit double figures for goals from the right wing and played himself into the Italy team this season, and Posh and Bukema both had great seasons. Lewis Ferguson chipped in with six league goals to total 11 league goals in two seasons, which is the most by a Scottish player in Serie A history, beating Dennis Law's record, and he develops a great relationship with Xerxes. But their defensive work rate has increased. They drag players out of position so that there's always a player available to pass to. Their tactics have changed with centre-backs pushing up in positions similar to John Stones at Man City. But where Bologna are different is that Motta encourages both centre-backs to push up into midfield and full-backs then drop back. Attackers and advanced midfielders can then use the centre-backs being so advanced to find space for runs, which is probably why Calafiori has registered five assists from centre-back this season. And pushing him further upfield got him two goals against Juventus in May. He's only two goals of the season, so let's not go overboard, but the tactics clearly work. They dominate possession with only Napoli having more possession of this season as a type and press high up the field to win the ball back and cause mistakes for teams. But none of this is possible without the worker manager Thiago Motta. In his day he was a class defensive mid with some top teams such as Atletico Madrid, Inter, PSG and Barcelona and Genoa, who became one of the best readers of the game on the continent, something which transcends into his management. He's worked with some top coaches such as Ancelotti, Rafa and Mourinho, but it's his old gaffer who he says he was especially influenced by Gian Piero Gasparini, his old Genoa boss. He was revolutionary with his aggressive press with high line, energetic wing backs and fast pace attacks, something Motta tries to emulate. Motta even said, if I'm coaching notes thanks to him, I had so many marvellous experiences with him and learned so much from his training sessions. In many ways he's similar to Xabi Alonso and although he cites Gasparino as a big influence, he plays with more patience and control than Gasparino. Many of his players desert their set positions to create confusion to opponents which led Motta to say, at times they even surprise me. They play an attractive style of calcio, but the club need to act fast. Motta's contract expires in the summer and Juventus have come sniffing, already offering him contract according to some sources. So the management are warning that you're not gonna get Motta, or something like that. Breasts have been rather good this year and we all love a good breast, but that came as a bit of a surprise to those in France. Oh, and sorry, I've censored them because YouTube policy is to censor any breasts, so um, yeah. They were lucky to avoid the drop in 2023. In fact, it was considered a bit of a miracle with the league reducing to 18 teams, therefore an extra relegation spot, and there were favourites for relegation this year. But they've now qualified for the Champions League for a team who has never played in the European competition before, and before this season, their best ever finish in the top flight was 8th in 1988. They were badly lacking creativity, lost their top forward Franck Honorat to Mönchengladbach, and to make things even worse for them, they have Steve Mooney in their team, so how has manager Eddie Kraut managed this? By having some pretty decent players playing well of course, so let's break that down. pierre Lys Moulou was a vital part of the Nice midfield when Patrick Vieira was gaffer, a calm midfielder who is comfortable on the ball with his excellent vision and who has a great season, and young left-back Bradley Lockhart had an excellent season and has been linked with Man United, 
but take my advice Bradley son, don't do it. His defensive partner on the other flank, Kenny Lala, has also had a great season, so has Roman Del Castillo, who was one of the best midfielders in the league, created the most chances, had the joint most assists, and just generally dictated the team tempo. Their defence is one of the tightest in the league, probably would have been the tightest if they didn't go on a mad run and conceded 13 in 4 matches, about a quarter of all goals they've conceded in the season, but was the foundation of their success. They secured European footy against their rivals Rennes. In a mad match and with the scores 4-4 in the last seconds, the ball fell to Lillian Brassier who headed in. With added drama that Brassier used to be a Rennes academy player, and you just can't write that kind of script. Well, I mean, if you can write a script about a cyborg travelling through time to protect a kid from being killed by a man made of liquid metal while a war rages on on Earth, I'm pretty sure you could write a script about a player scoring against his old club in the 96th minute, but you get my point. Then ironically, PSG sealed the Champions League for them when they beat Nice in the middle of May. So what about Eric Roy? Unlike the others in this video, he hasn't worked with top managers or a family of won World Cups. In fact, he was sat by Nice, which was later found to be wrongful and given compensation, and was the sporting director at Watford. So what's his story? His appointment was a big surprise in Brest as it was his first major position in over a decade. He kept them safe in the 2023-24 season and won Coach of the Year. He's just got the team more together, working on close relationships with his team, which is different from anything they'd had before. He knew they had a challenge and had to fight it together. He brought positive energy and a calm state of mind. He knew that with his team likely to be in a relegation battle, defence was key. So he instilled in his team that they're hard to break down. And with this mentality came decent results, which then increased confidence. Rinse and repeat. And this fighting spirit is why Brest aren't really reliant on any one player, except maybe Lise Malou. They all fight together. They primarily played on the counter-attack, but also passed the ball around at the back, which drew opponents in so they could smack long balls up to beat their block. Because of this, they had the third highest possession in the league and the most accurate long balls per match. As the season went on, Ura tried to lower expectations. It was only when they met their objective of 40 points that admitted he changed their objective. When they secured a Conference League spot, amazingly they adjusted their target to focus on Champions League qualification and all this with the 5th lowest wage bill in the league. And talking of which, they'll have a bit of work to do in Europe. Martin Sacciliano is a young forward on loan from Minto who chipped in with 8 goal contributions in the league but underperformed his XG, showing he was a little wasteful at times, as did Steve Mounier. They'll also have to move out as their little stadium, the Stade Francis Leblay, isn't up to UEFA standards. And who knows how they do under the new Champions League format. Out of the 36 in the competition, 24 teams will go through to the knockouts. So Brest are beginning to dream, and we can all dream of a little Brest. And that's it, thanks for watching, be sure to subscribe as there's a season review coming up in the next few weeks when all's done and dusted. Watch these on screen because they're awesome. See you soon, be kind to each other, wear sunscreen and have a great day.